Hi, my name is Charles Schre. I'm a first year PhD student in the music history theory and ethnomusicology area here in the Department of Music at Stony Brook University. Um, and today I have the distinct pleasure to um, interview one of my own professors in, in the department, um, Professor Erica Sapria Hanish. Hi, Erica. Hi, Charles. Um, so, so why don't we just go ahead and get started with the questions then? So, so um, could you explain to um, to people watching the video um, what 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 your role is exactly here in 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 in, in the Department of Music? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm an associate professor of music history and theory. Um, I teach classes both in the undergraduate major and uh, also non-major classes um, about music. Um, I'm a specialist in the Baroque, uh, but also I, I definitely have interest in the 16th century as well. Um, so I get to teach graduate courses that are more focused um, uh, on either Baroque performance practice, the class you're in right now, actually, that I co-teach with uh, our, uh, my colleague, Arthur Haas, uh, the harpsichord professor, um, but also getting more theoretical um, for the classes that are geared towards um, MA PhD students in music history and theory. I like to teach seminars and historical sound studies and all kinds of uh, all kinds of things that that um, that uh, relate to my research at any given point. Um, so I guess at what po at what point in your life did you realize that you want to study music history as, as a career? That's such a good question. Um, Sometimes I want to ask you that question too. Um, for me, uh, I guess we all have our origin stories. Um, for me, I was an undergraduate who had started out as a pianist, um, and then through a happy uh, turn, a twist of fate, uh, I started playing harpsichord. So, so first it was kind of moving back in time with the instrument that I that I was playing, um, and and getting to know the harpsichord, and and then realizing somewhat awkwardly at some point that I was spending far more time in the library than I was in the practice room and that maybe this was unusual um, and uh, maybe I should take that and run with it. And I realized I was so interested in the kinds of questions that some of my academic professors were asking. Um, I remember and I'm still in touch with all my undergrad professors um, and they were asking such good questions and I wanted to, I wanted to join the club and answer the questions right along with them. Uh, so it was as an undergrad, an advanced undergrad. Yeah. Um. So 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 you just mentioned that you play piano and harpsichord. Um. And 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 I have no doubt that you're you're superb in, in both instruments. But what is one instrument that you wish you knew how to play? Looking back, can I answer with two? I think I'd like sure. to. Answer. They're both plucked instruments, so it's one instrument family. Um. So one is the guitar. I just I don't think I don't I my my fingers don't think the way people who play fretted instruments. Uh, think and so I'd love to learn the guitar. Uh, that's one. Um, and uh, actually, my my husband has just ordered a guitar. He's a guitar player, so we we will have one showing up in the house. So it may be that uh, the pandemic unfolding as it does, I may actually learn how to play the guitar. Um, but another one, the other plucked string. Um, it's a very different uh, kind of instrument. Um, it's the sitar. Um, so my mother is from India, and um, she took some lessons on that when she was a young woman. And I love the sound. And I just growing up on the west coast of Canada with not a lot of Indians around, and certainly not a lot that were doing Indian classical music, I just never had the opportunity to learn it. So I think one one day I would love to be able to uh, to immerse myself in that tradition. I see. Um. So so one one of the reasons why why I chose Stony Brook to, to come here um and, and to come here for my PhD program was well was because um I, I knew that you were here and and I know I know what you, what your work is with with regards to um. And um to 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 um ensuring um disability access on this campus. So, and so and so and so this this is a question about your teaching method. How have you adjusted your teaching method to make course material more universally accessible to to anyone who might take your class? That's a great question, Charles. Um, uh, These are a whole a set of good good and interesting questions. This one I have to answer by saying that um, none of what I do to make my classes accessible. I can't take sole credit for any of it because it always comes about through a process of trial and error and oftentimes through students who help me understand what I should be doing differently or what I could be doing differently. And so um, I think when I started teaching, um, I was probably like a lot of other teachers, I wasn't particularly attuned uh, to the things I was doing that were inaccessible to students. Um, uh, and so over the years, teaching students who are partially sighted, students who are blind, um, students who use uh, mobility aids, um, over the years, um, 
I, I think of each of my courses as reflecting these layers of interaction with students who've helped me understand what I can do differently. So now when I do PowerPoint slides for my non-majors, for example, um, and I share them on Blackboard afterwards for them so that people who, if it goes too quickly, people can return uh, and revisit some of the stuff that went by quickly in class. That's one step, but also I'll add um, uh, uh, alt text descriptions to the images so that someone who is using a, a screen reader can um, understand what it is that um, is, is arrayed on the slide. I also try to keep um, material in the same location on the slides and not have it hop around all over the place, again, to sort of for facility of, of interacting with it. Um, uh, and, uh, and other things I try not to use like wild, crazy fonts all over the place just to try and minimize the kind of visual noise that might be coming, uh, coming the students way. And so over the years, I've tried to adjust things like that. One last thing I'll note, just um, because Long Island has unpredictable weather, especially in the winter. Um, one thing that I've tried to be really proactive about is letting any students who use mobility aids who may, who may have difficulty navigating around the snow um, to say, whatever you do don't worry if you're late for class or if you miss class we can talk about this you know i'll make sure you can catch up this is not on you let me know if there's something i can do to help if there's if you're encountering barriers with like snow piled up against a door or you know these kinds of things that happen so i, I try to be proactive about imagining scenarios that might be stressful for students but that should not be uh, and that i can help with and i thank you for for those those things that you do on a daily basis to to make everything accessible to everyone. Um, so um, we're, we're running slightly out of time. So I guess one last question that, that has been burning on everyone's minds. What exactly do you do when you're not doing research or anything academic related? <laughs> um, so there are two things that I've been doing since the pandemic. Um, one is gardening. I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but I'm very enthusiastic. So I like to go outside and, and you know, carefully nurture my plants, try not to kill them. You know, it's a, sort of a delicate balance between those two extremes. Um, and then the other thing I love to do, um, we have rescue dogs. And so we have three of them now and I enjoy taking care of them and walking them and pretending I'm training them. Um, those are all things that take up a great deal of time. So, uh, so that's what I do when I'm not doing my research or, or thinking about music. Okay, yeah, now, now that you mentioned dogs, we, we, we have to see them now. Could you show us your dogs? Okay, so here's what I'm going to say. Can you pause for a second to make it look like they're magically here? And then I'll bring one and then we'll just pretend like it happened really, really smoothly. I'm not sure Zeus will show up, but it's recording. Okay, so this is Mouse. She's uh, the middle one of our pack. She's the third, uh, the second one we got. And she's what's called a schnorky. Uh, she's a schnauzer Yorkie, and she's definitely the smartest one. We also have Zeus, who's an eight-year-old Akita. Um, he's the newest addition to the pack. Um, and then the, the one that I've had since she was a little puppy uh, was Co is Coco Mutt, who's a lab mix. And so they're our little pack, and we walk them. And, uh, and I do my best to keep uh, Mouse satisfied, because otherwise she will chew up all my socks. Wait, what, is Coco behind you currently? Coco has left the room. Oh, and and she's not. <laughs> so she may come. If you want to try, we can, you know, and we can trust uh, Catherine to edit this later appropriately. I can, I can try and grab a uh, Coco, or we can just, we can just acknowledge the reality that they just don't listen to me. Uh, I see. Uh, um, yeah, they, they can cut this out. So, so thank you for taking the time for, for, for this interview. And, and, and thank, 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 thank you for talking to me. Thanks for having uh, such great questions, Charles, and I'm really glad you're here.